Raised in New England among poetry, poverty, and many girls, Louisa May Alcott was poised to capture the experience of a young adult in an ever-changing America. The Civil War was over, and the women's suffrage movement had begun to gain national attention. In 1868, when her publisher asked her to write a story specifically aimed at girls, Alcott said she would try her best. But she thought the result, which she based on the experience of her own sisters, would bore readers. She couldn't have been more wrong. For generations, Little Women has captured the hearts of people of all genders, ages, and lifestyles. Its lovable characters and memorable stories highlight the difficulties of growing up and forging your own path, all the while learning to love others through these inevitable changes. We hope that our listeners will be reminded of the beauty of change and the gift of love. Grand Canyon University's College of Arts and Media presents a second series production of Little Women, a radio play. Sitting in their parlor, discontent and aimless, sat the March sisters, Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. It was Christmas Eve, and, as is not very often the case for children, this was unwelcome news. Christmas won't be Christmas without any presents. It's so dreadful to be poor. I don't think it's fair for some girls to have plenty of pretty things and other girls nothing at all. We've got father and mother, and each other. We haven't got father, and shall not have him for a long time. Joe didn't say perhaps never, but each silently added it, thinking of father far away where the fighting was. Mr. March had been too old to be drafted to the war, but believing in the Union cause and wanting to serve his country, the man volunteered himself as a chaplain. The girls thought how disagreeable it must be for their father to sleep in a tent and see horrible things they couldn't imagine. It's going to be a hard winter for everyone. So Mother proposed not having any presents because pleasure will... Meg, don't preach. I only mean that I don't see why we must give up everything. Each of us has a little spending money. I do wish we could have a little fun. I'm sure we work hard enough to earn it. I know I do. Teaching those tiresome children nearly all day. When I'm longing to enjoy myself at home. You don't have half such a hard time as I do with Aunt March. How would you like to be shut up for hours with a nervous, fussy old lady who keeps you trotting, is never satisfied, and worries you till you're ready to fly out the window or cry? It's wrong to fret, but I do think washing dishes and keeping things tidy is the worst work in the world. It makes me cross, and my hands get so stiff I can't practice my piano well at all. At least you have time for such pleasures, Beth. I don't believe any of you suffer as I do, for you don't have to go to school with impertinent girls who plague you if you don't know your lessons and laugh at your dresses. And label your father if he isn't rich. (laughs) Amy, if you mean libel, I'd say so, and not talk about labels, as if father was a pickle bottle. I know what I mean. And you needn't be satirical about it. It's proper to use good words and improve your vocabulary. Don't peck at one another, girls. Don't you wish we had the money Father lost when we were little, Joe? He was helping a friend. I know. But even so, I can't help but imagine how different it would all be. Oh, how happy and good we'd be if we had no worries. Yes, but though we have to work, we make fun of ourselves and are a pretty jolly set, as Joe would say. Joe does use such slang words. And the way she puts her hands in her pockets and whistles, it's so boyish. That's why I do it. I detest rude, unladylike girls. And I hate affected, nimini pimini chicks. Joe, Amy, don't. Really, girls, you are both to be blamed. You are old enough to leave off boyish tricks and to behave better, Josephine. It didn't matter so much when you were a little girl. 
You should remember that you're a young lady now. I'm not. I hate to think I've got to grow up and be Miss March and wear long gowns and look prim. I can't get over my disappointment in not being a boy. And it's worse than ever now, for I'm dying to go and fight with father. And I can only stay home and knit like a poky old woman. Poor Joe. It's not too bad, but it can't be helped. So you must try to be contented with making your name boyish and playing brother to us girls. As for you, Amy, you are altogether too particular and prim. Your airs are funny now, but you'll grow up an affected little goose if you don't take care. I like your nice manners and refined ways of speaking when you don't try to be elegant, but your absurd words are as bad as Joe's slang. But <laughs> if Joe was a tomboy and Amy a goose, what am I, please? You're a dear, Beth, and nothing else. Yes, yes, Beth is perfect. That six? Marmy will be here any minute. Let's clean up our sewing and make the parlor look fine. Joe, would you put Marmy's slippers by the fire to warm them? I'll light the lamp. These are quite worn out. Marmy must have a new pair. I thought I'd give her some with my dollar. No, I shall. I'm the oldest. Yes, but I'm the man of the family now father is away. And I shall provide the slippers. I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's each get her something for Christmas with the little spending money we have. She'll be so surprised since we won't get any gifts ourselves, but our pocket change will be better spent on Marmy than our whims. Oh, what Good a idea, idea. That's, <laughs> that's like you, dear. What will we get? I shall give her a nice pair of gloves. Army shoes, best to be had. Some handkerchiefs. All hemmed. I'll get a little bottle of cologne. She likes it, and it won't cost much, so I'll have some left to buy my pencils. Oh! Let Marmy think we are getting things for ourselves, and then surprise her. We must go shopping tomorrow afternoon, Neg. Now, let's rehearse. There is much to do before tomorrow night. The March girls were best able to collaborate and play in creating shows for their mother. Joe's affection for writing the scripts paired well with Meg's love to entertain and act. And, being young... Amy especially liked to be the center of attention. Beth had to be reassured with each production that only the most trusted of souls would watch their show, and this gave her enough courage to fill whatever role was assigned to her, villain, lover, or tree. Now, come along, Amy. You're as stiff as a poker in the fainting scene. I can't help it. I never saw anyone faint. Do it this way. Clasp your hands so and stagger across the room. You must frantically cry and nearly bring yourself to tears. And when the time comes, let your knees go and your body go limp. Try it. Roderico, save me. Save me. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> Glad to find you so merry, my girl. Hey, oh, well, dearies, how have you got on today? There was so much to do getting the boxes ready to send to the army men tomorrow that I didn't come home in the afternoon. Come and sit by the fire, Marmy. The girl's mother, whom they affectionately called Marmy, was a tall lady with hair only beginning to gray and a generous, playful look in her eyes. She was not elegantly dressed, but a noble-looking woman and the girls thought the gray cloak and unfashionable bonnet covered the most splendid mother in the world. I've got a treat for you after supper. <gasps> a surprise? Really? What um, is it? Mommy, 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 tell us! A letter! Yes, tell us! A letter from father? Yes, a nice long letter. He is well and thinks he shall get through the cold season better than we feared. He sends all sorts of loving wishes for Christmas and an especial message to you girls. Oh, Marmy, will you please read it to us now? Please, yes, please, Marmy, please, please right now, please. Please, please, please Marmy. All right. Settle in close around me. Make room for me, Amy. Joe, don't push. Father must be so brave to speak so cheerfully in these letters despite what he sees. When will he come home, Marmy? Not for many months, dear, unless he is sick. He will stay and do his work faithfully as long as he can, and we won't ask for him back a minute sooner than he can be spared. Now, for my darling wife, Today was a quiet day with little combat. I thank God that- and My men have had an easier week than those in Fredericksburg. This morning I was plagued with sorrow as I thought of all the moments I was missing in on our daughter's lives and how much we had given up. But as we came through a local town, I passed the Aid Society. I stopped, thinking of you and all you do to volunteer in our little community. There was an old man there asking for clothes and a blanket. 
he told the woman that all four of his sons were in the army. Two had died, and another was ill in Washington. He told the woman, I'd go myself if I was any use. As I ain't, I give my boys and give them free. He looked so sincere, and it made me ashamed to be so ungrateful when I have all my girls at home. Give them all my dear love and a kiss. Tell them I think of them day by day. Pray for them by night, and find my best comfort in their affection at all times. A year seems very long to wait before I see them, but remind them that while we wait, we may all work, so that these hard days need not be wasted. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children to you, will do their duty faithfully, fight their bosom enemies bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully that when I come back to them I may be fonder and prouder than ever. Ever of my little women. I'm a selfish girl, but I'll truly try to be better so he won't be disappointed in me. We all will. I think too much of my looks and hate to work, but won't anymore, if I can help it. And I'll try to be what he loves to call me, a little woman, and not be rough and wild, but do my duty here instead of wanting to be somewhere else. Oh, Joe. Girls, do you remember how you used to play Pilgrim's Progress when you were young? I remember. We were so taken by the story after you read it to us. Oh, yes. What fun it was, especially going by the lions and passing through the valley where the hobgoblins were. <laughs> I like the place where the bundles fell off and tumbled down the stairs. I don't remember much about it, except that I was afraid of the cellar and the dark entry and always liked the cake and milk we had up at the top. If I wasn't too old for such things, I'd rather like to play it again. We never are too old for this, my dear. Because it is a play we are playing all the time in one way or another. Our burdens are here, our road is before us, and the longing for goodness and happiness is the guide that leads us through many troubles and mistakes to the peace which is a true celestial city. Now, my little pilgrims, suppose you begin again, not in play, but in earnest and see how far on you can get before Father comes home. Really, Mother? Where are our bundles? Each of you told me what your burden was just now. Except Beth. I rather think she hasn't got any. Oh, yes, I have. Mine is dishes and dusters, and envying girls with nice pianos, and being afraid of people. <coughs> Let us do it. It is only another name for trying to be good, and the story may help us. For though we do want to be good, it is hard work and we forget and don't do our best. We were in the Slough of Despond tonight, and Mother came and pulled us out as help did in the book. We ought to have our role of directions like Christian. What shall we do about that? Look under your pillows Christmas morning and you will find your guidebook. Now, let us go to Hannah and see what lovely meal she has prepared for supper. What is it? Shh, 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 shh. You'll wake them. Merry Christmas. Is it morning? Just barely. Quickly, come look. How long have you been up? Not long. Joe. Long enough to go downstairs. There is an unsettling lack of Christmas down there. Not even a stocking on the mantle. Well, Marmy has said. Yes, I know, but I could not help but look. So... I came back up here to sit with my thoughts, and I wanted to share this with you. What? Look out there. It's a cold, gray dawn of morning. Do you hear the starlings and the nuthatches? Aren't they wonderful? Yes. But you've seen a hundred sunrises. Not so many. Uh, but as the day began making its way over the hills, I thought of it as a gift. God's gift to us on this meager Christmas morning. Merry Christmas. Joe, you're positively sentimental. I'm nothing of the sort. At least, I wasn't until I laid back down to sleep. And what do you think I should find? I haven't a clue. This. Joe, what a lovely book. The crimson, it's like... Love? <laughs> I was going to say royal. It's a fine color. Check your pillow. I'm sure you've got one, too. Mine's green. 
And mine is blue. Merry Christmas, Amy. Merry Christmas, Beth. Merry Christmas! Don't wake the house! Yes, Merry Christmas. What color is yours, Beth? Well, mine is rather a sort of drab, isn't it? Why, it's the color of a morning dove. Yes, the very thin. Pilgrim's Progress. I didn't think there were to be any presents. And yet, here they are. Girls, Mother wants us to read and love and mind these books, and we must begin at once. We used to be faithful about it, but since Father went away and all this war trouble unsettled us, we have neglected many things. But it's Christmas, and it's so early. You can do as you please, but I shall keep my book on the table here and read a little every morning, for I know it will do me good and help me through the day. A guidebook. That's right. In fact, I shall begin now. Well, move over, Meg. You'll not start without us. Come, Amy. Let's do as they do. I'll help you with the hard words, and they'll explain things if we don't understand. There's no room! Nonsense! There's always been room for all of us. Come on. Can we start with mine? It's such a lovely blue. Of course. Hand it over. Oh, you're on my arm, Beth. Oh, sorry. Here you go. Find a spot, Amy, and mind your elbows. Mind your knees. Hush, she's starting. The Pilgrim's Progress, From This World to That Which Is to Come, by John Bunyan. Part one, delivered under the similitude of a dream. You're reading the apology? Meg! <laughs> <laughs> Don't stop, Meg. When at the first I took my pen in hand thus for to write, I did not understand that I at all should make a little book in such a mode. Nay, I had undertook to make another. Hannah, have you seen Marmy? Now where are you off to in such a rush? Nowhere, I'm looking for Mother. Sixteen years I work here and not a thought to wish me a Merry Christmas. Forgive me, Hannah. Where's Mother? To see this age. Merry Christmas, Hannah. Yes, Merry Christmas. Where's Marmy? Goodness only knows. Some poor creature came a-begging and your ma went off to see what was needed. She'll be back soon, I think, so fry your own cakes and have everything made ready. Joe, Meg, oh, Merry Christmas, Hannah. Here's one who knows her manners. Merry Christmas, Miss Elizabeth. That's a fine basket you've got. There are presents for Marmy. Yes, but Amy's bottle is missing. What bottle, love? She bought a small bottle of cologne for Marmy. Yes, and it's missing. So is Amy. You'll find them both together, I expect. She'll be putting a ribbon or some such notion on the bottle. There's Mother. Hide the basket. Beth, quick! Where? The oven. You'll not be disturbing my pies. You'll let all the heat out. Beth, quickly, over here. Hannah, where's my... Ah! <gasps> Amy! You scared me half to death! Where have you been? And what are you hiding behind you? Nowhere. You wear a hood and cloak for nowhere? I do. I was being surreptitious. Surreptitious. <laughs> you don't wear a hood and cloak this early in the morning for anything. <laughs> don't laugh at me, Joe. I didn't mean anyone should know till the time came. I only meant to change the little bottle for a big one, and I gave all my money to get it, and I'm truly trying not to be selfish anymore. Amy, that's beautiful. Just beautiful. I'm sorry I misjudged you. I felt ashamed of my present after reading and talking about being good this morning. So I ran around the corner and changed the minute I was up, and I'm so glad for mine is the handsomest now. And now I take it back. This'll be your mother this time. Put the bottle in the basket. Thank you. Slide it over here, to the sofa. Everyone to the table. We'll make like we've been here all morning. Girls? Girls? There you are. I didn't expect you to be down so early. Merry Christmas, Hannah. I'm sorry I had to bustle off before I wished you a proper one. It's all right, Mum. Merry Christmas to you and yours. I'm sure they're glad of it. Merry Christmas, Marmy! We were just sitting down to breakfast. Thank you for our books. We read some and mean to every day. Merry Christmas, little daughters. But I want to say one word before we sit down. Not far from here lies a poor woman with a little newborn baby. Six children are huddled into one bed to keep them from freezing, for they have no fire. There is nothing to eat over there, and the oldest boy came to tell me they were suffering hunger and cold. 
my girls. Will you give them your breakfast as a Christmas present? I'm so glad you came before we began. May I go and help carry the things to the poor little children? I shall take the cream and the muffins. But you love cream and muffins. She's turning a new leaf, Mother. Meg? Oh, I see you've already covered the buckwheats. And grab the bread, too, will you? Yes, Mother. I thought you'd do it. You shall all go and help me, and when we come back, we will have bread and milk for breakfast and make it up at dinner time. And after dinner, we'll still do the play? Wherein I'll catch the, the conscience of the king! Now hurry. It's early enough we shan't be seen by many on our way. I'm so yes, glad I fun. <laughs> What a merry Christmas indeed. to persuade your overtures are meaningless to me i will not be refused you'll spend your days in a nunnery or i am not don pedro will no one see me in my distress rodrigo it's you it is i rodrigo it is thee i it is me and hand her villain Sorry, the cot won't stop. Shh. I'm no villain. I'm her father, and you, boy, you are nothing. I'm her love. Yes, father, and I love him. Your love is nothing either, for you are poor and destitute and unfit for my daughter. So I will give her to God. Shh. Shh. It's this old cot. Let me go get a chair from the mother. Marmy, please. All right, go on. It's all prepared, Mom. Hannah! Hannah! Thank you, Hannah. Hannah, sit next to Marmy. The cot will fit, too. We're nearly finished. May we continue? You'll get no argument from me. Meg, from the last. Your love is nothing either, for you are poor and destitute and unfit for my daughter. So I will give her to God. God of Vida. Vitaly Bor. Da Forza. Metamorphos. No, father, no. But a Vida. Vitaly Bor. Da Forza. Metamorphos. But a Vida. Vitaly Bor. Da Forza. Metamorphos. But a Vida. Vitaly Bor! Masters, masters, a word if you please. What is this insolence? A letter, a letter, a letter for Rodrigo bringing you untold riches. Riches? And for you, Don Pedro, certain doom if you keep these lovers apart. Gracious! Oh, 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 oh Hannah! Oh, 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 my goodness! Oh, my gosh! Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Are you okay? Marmy! <laughs> hold still, Marmy. I told you the cot couldn't hold her. You never. Glory be. <laughs> the whole thing's folded them inside. Here, lift your side back. <laughs> Got it, Meg. Amy, give me a hand, too. But Joe's not doing anything. Amy, Curtis, March, help your sisters. With me now. Heave! <laughs> okay, I'm oh, careful, oh, 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 Don't hurt them. them. Don't hurt them. Careful! Thank heaven. Begging your pardon, Mom. Are you all right, Marmy? Yes, quite all right. Just a little bit more of an adventure than we'd planned. Don't trouble your thoughts, Hannah. Speaking of ventures, Mom. Yes, yes, quite. Girls? Yes, Mommy? Were you finished? Well, we had the treasure and all of the tin, Mommy, and the chorus. Yes, Mother, we were done. Well, splendid. Then Hannah has prepared a special treat for you downstairs. A treat? What sort of treat? Let's all go downstairs and see. Yeah, okay, okay, stop it! I want to see! <gasps> Marmy, oh mother, it's why there's cakes and fruit. I've never seen so much. What are these? Those are bonbons, dear. They're French. And ice cream? Ice cream? Two kinds? Pink and white? 
Is it fairy? Santa Claus. Mother did it. Aunt March had a good fit and sent it. All wrong. Old Mr. Lawrence sent it. The Lawrence boy's grandfather? What in the world put such a thing into his head? Hannah told one of his servants about your breakfast party at the Hummels, and that pleased him. He thought he'd send a few trifles in honor of the day. That Lawrence boy put it into his head. I know he did. He's a capital fellow, and I wish we could get acquainted. I reckon you do, but Meg is so prim she won't let Joe speak to him when they pass. I am not. Not prim, dear? No, Marmy. Ugh. Well, I like his manners. And he looks like a little gentleman, so I've no objection to your knowing him if a proper opportunity comes. I mean to, for he needs fun. I'm sure he does. Look at these flowers, Amy. We never had such a fine bouquet before. How pretty it is. They are lovely, but Beth's roses are sweeter to me. I wish I could send my bunch to Father. I'm afraid he isn't having such a Merry Christmas as we are. No, I doubt he is. Amy, will you bring me my new slippers from beside my bed? Stop moving, Meg, or you'll burn yourself on these tongs. It was so nice of Mrs. Gardner to invite you two to her party. That it was, Beth. I'm terribly excited to dance and meet a few of Sally's friends. I can't wait until Beth and I are old enough to be invited to New Year's Eve parties. Meg, you must take note of everything and tell us about it tonight. I won't leave out a single detail. And even though we don't have fashionable silks or new gloves or a proper carriage... We March girls will have a wonderful time and not care at all what people think of us. Isn't that right, Meg? Right. Though I do wish we could have done more about your dress. I've sewn it up, but the burn shows badly and I can't take it out. You must sit still all you can and keep your back out of sight. The front is all right. And remember to hide the lemonade stain on your gloves by not lifting your hands. Hold your shoulders straight and take short steps and don't shake hands if you're introduced to anyone. And don't say anything rude or unladylike. Christopher Columbus! If it were not for you, I shouldn't go at all. I hate company dancing and the silly rules about what is and isn't proper. Joe, aren't the rollers to smoke like that? What a strange smell. It's the dampness drying. I'm sorry, Joe. I am grateful you're going, and I must be content with my poplin dress and modest things. I only wish to enjoy myself tonight. You'll look prettier than any other girl in silk at the dance, Meg. There. Now I'll take off the papers and you'll see a cloud of little ring... Ringlets. That doesn't look like a little cloud of ringlets. <gasps> Joe? Uh, <laughs> Joe? Amy, it's not funny! What's Meg? Joe? N nothing. Nothing. Give me the mirror. Oh. 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 What have you done? You burned my hair! Joe! Oh, yeah, that Meg, looks pretty please bad. don't cry. Just my luck. You shouldn't have asked me to do it. I always spoil everything. I'm so sorry, but the tongs were too hot and I've made a mess. I can't go tonight. <laughs> it's ruined. <laughs> oh, my hair. <laughs> it isn't ruined. Just frizzle it and tie your ribbon so the ends come under your forehead a bit and it, it will look like the latest fashion. I've seen many girls do it so. <laughs> it serves me right for trying to be fun. I wish I'd left my hair alone. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. It's not that bad. I, I promise. We can fix it. Maybe it's just that's it. Never touching hair again. <laughs> Meg, what is it? Can we go, please? It's dreadfully dull if there's some red-headed boy who has been looking to me as if to ask me to dance for the last few minutes. I can't leave yet. It would be impolite. <coughs> I'm sorry, Joe, but you'll have to make do. Margaret, dear. Coming. But Meg, he is coming this way. <clears throat> oh, dear me. I didn't know anyone was here. I'll go. Don't mind me. Please, stay if you'd like. Shan't I disturb you? Not a bit. I only came to the side room because I don't know many people and I felt rather strange at first. So did I. But don't go away. Please. Unless you'd rather. I think I've had the pleasure of seeing you before. You live near us, don't you? You're the Lawrence boy that lives next door. 
<laughs> we did have such a good time over your nice Christmas presents. My grandfather sent it, Miss March. But you put it into his head, didn't you now? Well, I don't... I, I'm. And I'm not Miss March. I'm only Joe. I'm not Mr. Lawrence. I'm only Lori. Lori Lawrence. What an odd name. My first name is Theodore, but I don't like it. But the fellows at school called me Dora, so I made them call me Lori instead. I hate my name, too. So sentimental. I wish everyone would say Joe instead of Josephine. How did you make the boys stop calling me Dora? I thrashed them. <laughs> <laughs> I can't thrash Aunt March, so I suppose I shall have to bear it. Don't you like to dance, Miss Joe? I like it well enough if there is plenty of room and everyone is lively. In a place like this, I'm sure to upset something, tread on people's toes, or do something dreadful. So I keep out of mischief and let Meg sail about. Don't you dance? Sometimes. You see, I've been abroad a good many years and haven't been into company enough yet to know how you do things here. Abroad? Don't I wish I'd been there. Please tell me about it. Have you been to Paris? We spent last winter there. Oh, do say some French. I can read it, but can't pronounce. Quel nom cette jeune demoiselle on la partout en Julie? How nicely you do it. Let me see. You said, who is the young lady in the pretty slippers, didn't you? Oui, mademoiselle. It's my sister Margaret. Do you think she is pretty? Yes. She makes me think of the German girls. She looks so fresh and quiet and dances like a lady. She's the oldest? Yes. Meg is 16 and my sisters are 13 and 12. How excited they'll be when I tell them the Lawrence boy is friendly and cultured and educated. We've seen you studying hard at your books. I suppose you're going back to Europe for college soon? Not for a year or two. I won't go before 17 anyway. How I wish I was going to college. You don't look as if you liked it. It's nothing but grinding or skylarking. And I don't like the way fellows do either in this country. What do you like? To live in Italy and to enjoy myself in my own way. That's a splendid polka. Why don't you go and try it? If you will come too. I, I can't, for I told Meg I wouldn't, uh, because... Because what? You won't tell? Never. Well, I have a bad trick of standing before the fire, and so I burn my frocks, and I scorched this one, and though it's nicely mended, it shows. And Meg told me to keep still so no one would see it. You may laugh if you want to. It's funny, I know. Never mind that. I'll tell you how we can manage. There's a long hall out there, and we can dance grandly, and no one will see us. Please come. All right. A dance, my lady. Joe? Joe! Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were with someone. Meg, this is Lori Lawrence. How do you do? Are you all right? I've sprained my ankle. Sit down. Thank you. That stupid high heel turned and gave me a sad wrench. It aches so, and I can hardly stand, and I don't know how I'm ever going to get home. I knew you'd hurt your feet with those silly shoes. I'm sorry, but I don't see what you can do, except get a carriage or stay here all night. I can't have a carriage without its costing ever so much. I dare say I can't get one at all, for most people come in their own, and it's a long way to the stable and no one to send. You'll take my carriage. Oh, but Mr. Lawrence... It's so early. You can't mean to go yet. I always go early. I do. Truly. Please, let me take you home. It's on my way, you know. And it looks like rain. <laughs> that settles it then. Thank you, Lori. And that settled it. They rolled away in the luxurious carriage, feeling very festive and elegant. When they pulled up to the March House, curious eyes peeked out from behind the curtains and stared at the strange boy helping their sister to the door. Little Amy was taken with Lori's good looks and posh manners. For the next two weeks, all the Marches hoped they would catch sight of that carriage so that they might have the opportunity to talk more with the Lawrence boy. But, to their dismay, he never came out. Not wanting to be a nuisance, Meg told her sisters to wait for the next chance opportunity to see Lori again. However, on one blustering afternoon, Jo found herself restlessly shoveling snow in the field between the two houses when she spotted a familiar profile in the window. Miss Jo! How do you do? Fine, thank you. This is some snow to be out and about in. <coughs> Are you sick? Better, thank you. I've had a bad cold and been shut up a week. 
I'm sorry. What do you amuse yourself with? Nothing. It's dull as tombs up here. Don't you read? Not much. They won't let me. Can't somebody read to you? Grandpa does sometimes, but my books don't interest him. And I hate to ask Brooke all the time. Brooke? Mr. Brooke is my tutor. Ah. Have someone come and see you then. There isn't anyone I'd like to see. Boys make such a row, and my head is weak. Isn't there some nice girl who'd read and amuse you? Girls are quiet and like to play nurse. Don't know any. You know us. So I do. Will you come, please? I'm not quiet and nice, but I'll come if Mother will let me. I'll go ask her. Shut the window like a good boy and wait till I come. Here I am, bag and baggage. Mother sent her love and was glad if I could do anything for you. Meg wanted me to bring some of her blanc mange. She makes it very nicely. That looks too pretty to eat. It isn't anything. Only they all felt kindly and wanted to show it. I'll put it to the side and you can have some at tea. What cozy room this is. It might be if it was kept nice, but the maids are lazy and I don't know how to make them mind. I'll write it up in two minutes. How kind you are. But please, take the big chair and let me do something to amuse my company. No. I came to amuse you. Shall I read aloud? We can start with these. Thank you. I've read all those. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk. I'll talk all day if you'll only set me going. Beth says I never know when to stop. Is Beth the rosy one who stays at home good deal and sometimes goes out with a little basket? Yes, that's Beth. She's my girl, and a regular good one she is, too. The pretty one is Meg, and the blonde, curly-haired one is Amy, I believe. How did you find that out? Well, you see, I often hear you calling to one another, and when I'm alone up here, I can't help looking over at your house. You always seem to be having such good times. I beg your pardon for being so rude, but sometimes you forget to put down the curtain at the window where the flowers are, and when the lamps are lighted, it looks like a picture to see the fire and you all around the table with your mother. Her face is right opposite, and it looks so sweet behind the flowers. I can't help watching it. I haven't got any mother, you know. I'm sorry. We'll never draw that curtain anymore, and I give you leave to look as much as you like. I just wished, though, you'd come over and see us. Mother is so splendid. She'd do you heaps of good. And Beth would sing to you if I begged her to. And Amy would dance. Meg and I would make you laugh over our funny stage antics. And we'd have jolly times. Wouldn't your grandfather let you? I think he would if your mother asked him. He's very kind, though he does not look so. And he lets me do what I like. Pretty much. Only, he's afraid I might be a bother to strangers. We are not strangers. We are neighbors, and you needn't think you'd be a bother. We want to know you, and I've been trying to do this ever so long. We haven't been here a great while, you know, but we have got acquainted with all our neighbors but you. Grandpa lives amongst his books and doesn't mind much what happens outside. And Mr. Brooke doesn't stay here, you know, and, and I have no one to go about with me, so I just stop at home and get on as I can. Well... You shall have four friends next door, plus mother. And if you don't come and visit us soon, I'll drag you over there myself. It's no good to spend all of your time in school with no fun. I suppose you're right. Thank you. Do you like your school? Don't go to school. I'm a businessman. Girl, I mean. I go to wait on my great aunt, and a dear cross old soul she is, too. Is this the Aunt March you mentioned at the party? Yes. I spend my days with the woman winding yarn or washing her poodle or reading her Belsham's essays by the hour. I wouldn't mind reading aloud to her if it wasn't so dreadfully dull. <laughs> and if she didn't feel the need to criticize me and mother and father at every opportunity. Sounds like marvelous company. Yes, it isn't all bad, though. She's very wealthy and has a fine library that I steal away to whenever she falls asleep or has company. Well... If you like libraries so much, would you like to come down and see ours? Oh, Lori, could I? Certainly. Grandfather is out, so you needn't be afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. I don't believe you are.
It's beautiful. A room full of leather and art and other people's words. Theodore Lawrence, you ought to be the happiest boy in the world. A fellow can't live on books. Mercy me, it's your grandpa. Well, what if it is? You aren't afraid of anything, you know. I think I am a little bit afraid of him. But I don't know why I should be. Mommy said I may come, and I don't think you're any the worse for it. I'm a great deal better for it, and ever so much obliged. I'm only afraid that you were very tired of talking to me. It was so pleasant. I couldn't bear to stop. Anyways, I doubt my grandfather would ring his own doorbell. <laughs> I'm sure it's the doctor come to check on me. Would you mind if I left you for a minute? I suppose I must see him. Don't mind me. I'm happy as a cricket here. Lori, I found your grandfather's portrait over here in the corner. Now that I look at him, I'm sure that I shouldn't be afraid of him, for he's got kind eyes, though his mouth is grim. He isn't as handsome as my grandfather, but I like him. Thank you, ma'am. Christopher Columbus! Oh, I... Mr. Lawrence. So, you're not afraid of me, eh? Not much, sir. And you don't think me as handsome as your grandfather? Not quite, sir. But you like me in spite of it? Yes, I do, sir. <laughs> You've got your grandfather's spirit if you have in his face. He was a fine man, my dear. But what is better is he was a brave and honest one. And I was proud to be his friend. What have you been doing with this boy of mine, eh? Only trying to be neighborly, sir. I offered to read to him, and we began to chat, and he began to show me your library and seemed to enjoy it. You think he needs cheering up a bit, do you? Yes, sir. He seems a little lonely, and young folks would do him good, perhaps. We are only girls, but we should be glad to help if we could, for we haven't forgotten the splendid Christmas present you sent us. Oh, that was the boy's affair. How is the poor woman? Doing nicely, sir. Mother went to see Mrs. Hummel and her children just this morning. Reminds me of her father's way of doing good. I shall come to see your mother some fine day. Tell her so. There's the tea bell. We have it early on the boy's account. Come down and go on being neighborly. If you'd like to have me, sir. Shouldn't ask you if I didn't. Shall we? Joe, you'll never guess what I... Oh. Grandfather. Uh, I... And you two... What the dickens has gotten into you, Lori? I didn't know you'd come, sir. Well, that's evident by the way you racket down the stairs. Come to your tea, sir, and behave like a gentleman in front of our guest. And then I walked home. Mr. Lawrence told me to tell you that he would come and visit you soon, Marmy. And Lori said that we would all be welcome to visit them at their home. May we, Marmy? Certainly. As long as we do not impose our company on the Lawrences. Perhaps we shall all go together this week. It was so kind of Mr. Lawrence to speak of my father. I wonder what else he remembers of him. I would love to see the beautiful flowers in their conservatory. And I want to see the grand statues and paintings. Oh, that reminds me. There was a grand piano, Beth. Only, Mr. Lawrence didn't like to hear Lori play. But I'm sure you would change his mind, Beth. I'd be far too frightened to play. But if you go with me, Joe, I would like to see it. Why did Mr. Lawrence not like to hear Lori play? Does he play very badly? No, in fact, he was very talented. He played a few songs, and then Mr. Lawrence said, uh, Too many sugar plums are not good for him. His music isn't bad, uh, but I hope he will do as well in more important things. He was very kind to me as I left the home, but I could tell something had upset him. I asked Lori, and he said that one day he would tell me why he does not like to hear him play. Until then, it feels like a great mystery. How odd. Beth plays our piano every night, and it is often my favorite part of the day, even if it is old and out of tune in the key stick. How could someone dislike music? I'm not sure, but I think it was because his son, Lori's father, married an Italian lady. She was a musician, which displeased the old man, who was very proud. The lady was good and lovely and accomplished, but he still did not like her, and never saw his son after he married. They both died when Lori was a little child, and then his grandfather took him home. 
I fancy the boy who was born in Italy is not very strong, and the old man is afraid of losing him, which makes him so careful. Laurie comes naturally by his love of music, for he is like his mother, and I dare say his grandfather fears that he may want to be a musician. At any rate, his skill reminds him of the woman he did not like. Dear me, how romantic! How silly! Let him be a musician if he wants to, and not plague his life out sending him to college when he hates to go. That's why he has such handsome black eyes and pretty manners, I suppose. Italians are always nice. What do you know about his eyes and his manners? You hardly spoke to him. I saw him at the party, and what you tell shows that he knows how to behave. That was a nice little speech about the medicine Mother sent him. He meant the blanc mange, I suppose. How dense you are, Joe. He meant you, of course. Did he? I never saw such a girl. You don't know a compliment when you get it. I think they are great nonsense, and I'll thank you not to be silly and spoil my fun. Lori's a nice boy, and I like him. And I won't have any sentimental stuff about compliments and such rubbish. We'll all be good to him because he hasn't got any mother or sisters, and he may come over and see us. May he, Mommy? Yes, Joe. Your little friend is very welcome. And I hope Meg will remember that children should be children as long as they can. Well, I don't call myself a child, and I'm not in my teens yet. What do you say, Beth? I was thinking about our pilgrim's progress. <laughs> you haven't heard a word we've said, have you? Well, I was thinking about how we got out of the slough and through the wicked gate by resolving to be good and up the steep hill by trying. And that maybe the house over there, full of splendid things, is going to be our palace beautiful. We have to get by the lions first, Beth. Come in. Mr. Brooke, my good man. Sir, what can I do for you? Well, sir, I've come to discuss a rather delicate matter. Delicate? That is, I only wish for you to know that young Mr. Lawrence has skipped a Latin lesson again, today. I see. I don't mean to overstep at all, sir, but ever since the March girls have been around the last month or so, Lori has been distracted. Distracted? I mean, no offense to you or the young ladies. But when he goes to the March home, he's always late to return. And just as often, I find him entertaining the girls in some part of the house when he's meant to be working with me. Now, they seem to be lovely girls, but... Have you noticed anything else about Lori since becoming friendly with the Marches? Sir? Happier. More caring. I'll admit that Lori has seen fewer of his foul teenage moods. The good lady next door says he's studying too hard. Needs young society, amusement, and exercise. I suspect she's right, and that I've been coddling the fellow. I'll talk to Lori about respecting your time, and be sure that he will make up his work later. But, for now, let him do what he likes, as long as he's happy. He can't get into much mischief in that little nunnery over there, and Miss March is doing more for him than we can. Understood, sir. Would the member, Mr. Nathaniel Winkle, respectfully read the pick Club's announcement from the week's paper. Thank you, gentlemen, thank you. Announcement, the Dust Pan Society will meet on Wednesday next and parade in the upper story of the clubhouse. All members to appear in uniform and shoulder their brooms at nine precisely. A new play will appear at the Barnville Theater in the course of a few weeks, which will surpass anything ever seen on the American stage. The name of this thrilling drama is The Greek Slave, or Constantine the Avenger. Constantine the Avenger. That's what I said. And finally, a weekly meeting will be held at Kitchen Place to teach young ladies how to cook. Hannah Brown will preside, and all are invited to attend. This concludes the week's announcements. Thank you, Mr. President. Aye, oh, aye, oh, yes, I agree. And the meeting you here. Thank you, Mr. Winkle. Now, seeing as there is no further business, the chair wishes to... Wait, wait, Mr. President. I do have a bit of new business I wish to add to the agenda. The chair recognizes Mr. Augustus Snodgrass. Mr. President and gentlemen, 
I wish to propose the admission of a new member. One who highly deserves the honor, would be deeply grateful for it, and would add immensely to the spirit of the club, the literary value. Mm. Oh, mm -hmm. The paper, everyone be quiet. And be no end jolly and nice. I propose Mr. Theodore Lawrence as an honorary member of the PC. <laughs> <laughs> Are you quite serious, Joe? We don't wish any boys. They only joke and bounce about. This is a ladies' club, and we wish to be private and proper. Oh, yes, this club is very proper. Come now. I'm afraid he'll laugh at our paper and, and make fun of us afterward. Lori won't do anything of the sort. He likes to write, and he'll give a tone to our contributions to keep us from being sentimental. Don't you see? We can do so little for him. And he does so much for us, I think the least we can do is to offer him a place here and make him welcome if he comes. Yes, we ought to do it, even if we are afraid. I say he may come if he likes. Mr. President, I second the motion to admit Mr. Theodore Lawrence. Very well, Mr. Tupman. All in favor, say aye. Aye! Motion passed! Good! Bless you. Now, as there is nothing like taking time by the fetlock, as Winkle characteristically observes, allow me to present the new member. Oh! <laughs> <Hey>! <laughs> the whole time? Gentlemen, you must forgive my noble patron. I planned the joke and she only gave in after lots of teasing. Come now, you know I suggested hiding in the wardrobe. Never mind what she says, I'm the wretch that did it, sirs. But on my honor, I will never do so again, and henceforth devote myself to the interests of this immortal club. Hear, hear! Now introducing the newest member of the Pickwick Club, Mr. Sam Weller! <laughs> hear, hear! Oh. <laughs> I merely wish to say that as a slight token of my gratitude for the honor done me, and as means of promoting friendly relations between adjoining nations, I have set up a post office in the hedge in the lower corner of the garden. It will hold all sorts of things and save our valuable time. It will be uncommonly nice, I fancy. Allow me to present the members their keys. And with many thanks for your favor, I take my seat. I can tell you how grateful I am for this, Mr. Lawrence. There really is nothing, ma'am. It's my pleasure. She'll be down any minute. Are you sure about this? Your other daughters come and go from the house with Lori as they please. This seems to be the only way to have her over without frightening her. Did you call for me, Marmy? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll come back later. Wait, Beth. Hannah has been hard at work today and has not had time to put away the sewing for company. Would you please do that for me? Must I do it now, Mother? Yes, Beth. Mr. Lawrence is here now, and I'd like the parlor to be put together for our guest. Yes, Mother. I'm sorry for the interruption, Mr. Lawrence. You were telling me about Laurie's tutors and lessons. Yes, his music teacher. I've had to let the fellow go. The boy neglects his music now, and I'm glad of it for he was getting too fond of it. But the piano suffers for want of use, and his tutor has left all of the sheet music behind in technique books. Wouldn't some of your girls like to run over and practice on it every now and then? Just to keep it in tune, you know, ma'am. Oh? They needn't see or speak to anybody, but run in any time. For I am shut in my study at the other end of the house. Lori is out a great deal, and the servants are never near the drawing room after nine o'clock. I must be off, Miss March. But please, tell the young ladies what I say. And if they don't care to come, why, never mind. Oh, sir, they do care. Very, very much. Are you the musical girl? I'm Beth. I love it dearly, and I'll come if you are quite sure nobody will hear me and be disturbed. Not a soul, my dear. The house is empty half the day, so come and drum away as you like. And I shall be obliged to you. How kind you are, sir. I had a little girl once, with eyes like yours. God bless you, my dear. Good day, madam. 
Good day, Mr. Lawrence. Oh! Oh, Beth! <laughs> Can you believe it, Mother? Oh, Beth, I am so proud of you. <laughs> After that, the little brown hood slipped through the hedge nearly every day, and the great drawing room was haunted by a tuneful spirit that came and went unseen. She never knew that Mr. Lawrence cracked his study door open to hear the sweet tunes he liked. She never saw Laurie mount guard in the hall to warn the servants away. She never suspected that the exercise books and new songs which she found in the rack were put there for her especial benefit. And when Laurie talked to her about music at home, she only thought how kind he was to tell her things that helped her so much. So she enjoyed herself heartily and found, what isn't always the case, that her granted wish was all she had hoped. Your mood. Don't sound so confident. Lori? Hmm? Does your grandfather like heartsies? I couldn't say I know, Beth. I'm sorry. Why? I'm working on a pair of slippers for him to thank him for being so generous and allowing me to come play your piano so often, and I'm trying to decide what flower to sew in. Whatever you choose, Beth, I'm sure he will love. When they are done, would you help me smuggle them into his study? I don't wish to be a bother or embarrass him. Certainly. I will. Check. What? Hmm. Come, Keddy. It would be far more respectable to withdraw now. And let you win again? You're delaying the inevitable. Let's end it here. That's not how the game works, dear. <sighs> All right. Thank you, Madam Mother. Just for that, I'm going to take my time. Christopher Columbus. Must... Move King Marnie Marnie Amy, what on earth is the matter? M Mr. Davis hit me. What? How dare he? On oh, my hand. He took his ruler and hit my palm several times. What a horrid man! Poor Amy. And he made me stand in front of the class and wait there fifteen minutes when they were all at recess. He told me I could join them again for a recess, but I couldn't do it, Marmy. I couldn't cry in front of everyone and had kept it together up until then, so I came straight home to tell you. The thought of some perfect stranger thinking it proper to hit a young girl's hand. She can never go back there, Mother. She's right, Amy. I won't be sending you back there, and you were right to come straight to me. But I want you to study a little every day with Beth. I don't approve of corporal punishment, especially for girls. I dislike Mr. Davis's manner of teaching and don't think the girls you associate with are doing you any good. So, I shall ask your father's advice before I send you anywhere else. Let me find some gauze for you. That's good. I wish all the girls would leave and spoil his old school. Let's see your wound then, Amy. Well, you may have marks for a bit, but I think you'll be just fine. Maybe you'll get lucky and have a scar to show proof of your harrowing tale. Wrap this around your hand, my dear. No. Tell me what you did to earn this punishment. Amy. Well, Meg gave me some of her money so I may bring pickled limes to school. Pickled limes? Well, the girls are always buying them and trading them for pencils, bead rings, paper dolls, or something else at recess. Some people choose to suck on them at their desk, but unless you want to be thought mean, you must gift and exchange limes. Are limes the fashion now? It used to be pricking bits of rubber to make balls. But... Mr. Davis decided to consider Lime's contraband around two weeks ago. Amy. I know, Marmy. But the only reason I had to bring them was because I was so dreadfully in debt to other girls so I could be thought of as nice and lovely. And I was going to hand them all out at recess. But then, when I wouldn't give one to Jenny Snow, who treated me awfully yesterday when I had no pickled limes to my name, she told Mr. Davis they were in my desk. Oh, Amy... And another teacher was there to observe Mr. Davis that day. Oh, Amy. And... Oh, oh. I'm sorry, Marmy. I didn't bring them all out with me at first. But when he asked, is that all? I didn't want to lie and disappoint you, so... I had to retrieve the rest. Oh, Amy. I know, I know. Mr. Davis was maddening, though. He made me dump the whole bag of perfectly good limes out the window before he decided to make me an example and draw my blood. 
I am not sorry you lost them, for you broke the rules and deserve some punishment for disobedience. Do you mean you are glad I was disgraced before the whole school? I should not have chosen that way of mending a fault, but I'm not sure that it won't do you more good than a bolder method. You are getting to be rather conceited, my dear, and it is quite time you set about correcting it. You are so often petted by your sisters and Hannah and myself, and maybe it has done you some harm. No. Marmy! Amy, you have a good many little gifts and virtues, but there is no need of parading them, for conceit spoils the finest genius. Your mother is very wise on all things about modesty, Amy. I knew a girl once who had a really remarkable talent for music, and she didn't know it. Never guessed what sweet little thing she composed when she was alone, and wouldn't have believed it if anyone had told her. I wish I'd known that nice girl. Maybe she would have helped me. I'm still so slow. You do know her, and she helps you better than anyone else could. Oh, do you think I'm conceited, Lori? Not in the least. That is why you are so charming and we all like you so much. Your mother just means wishes for you to remain this way. I see. So, it's nice to have accomplishments and be elegant, but not to show off or get perked up. Precisely. These things are always seen and felt in a person's manner and conversations. But with you March girls, it isn't necessary to display them. Any more than it's proper to wear all your bonnets and gowns and ribbons at once. That folks may know you've got them. Thank you, Lori. Will you come visit me while I study with Beth some? Nothing would please me more. We should wash out your hand, Amy. Let me help you. Thank you for being a regular brother to them. Of course. Now then, it's your turn. Oh, check. Oh, 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 you fell for it. Checkmate. <laughs> I can't believe you fell for it. Ah! <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, okay. I see her. She's coming up the way now. Be sure to keep her in the hall first, Joe. The child won't know what to do with herself. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, Beth, stay here for one moment. You received a letter from the old gentleman. Mr. Lawrence? But not just a letter. Come and see. I... Oh, Beth. <laughs> oh, Beth, your own piano. For me? Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> yes, all for you. Isn't it splendid of him? Don't you think he's the dearest old man in the world? The key to it is in the letter. We didn't open it, but we are dying to know what he says. You read it, Joe. I don't think I could. Oh, this is too lovely. Sit down at the bench, Beth. To Miss Elizabeth March. Dear Madam, how nice it sounds. I wish someone would write to me so. I have had many pairs of slippers in my life, but I never had any that suited me so well as yours. Heart's Ease is my favorite flower, and these will always remind me of the gentle giver. I like to pay my debts, so I know you will allow the old gentleman to send you something which once belonged to the little granddaughter he lost. With hearty thanks and best wishes, I remain... Your grateful friend and humble servant, James Lawrence. Oh. Beth, that's an honor to be <laughs> proud of, I'm sure. Lori told me how fond Mr. Lawrence used to be of the child who died, and how he kept all her little things carefully. Just think, he's giving you her piano. That comes of having big blue eyes and loving music. Your humble servant, James Lawrence. Only think of his writing that to you. I'll tell the girls. They'll think it's splendid. See the cunning brackets to hold candles? And the nice green silk? You'll have to go and thank him. Yes, I mean to. I guess I'll go now, before I get frightened thinking about it. <gasps> <laughs> I do believe the world is coming to an end. Oh, Beth. Well, I wish I may die if it ain't the strangest thing I ever see. It has turned her head. She'd never have gone in holy twine before. She's faced the lions. She's entered the palace beautiful. Come in. I 
came to thank you, sir. For... Oh. Oh. My dear. I don't know how I will ever thank you enough. How about this? Though you have your own piano now, will you still come to play here every once in a while? I try to give you the privacy, I promise, but admit that nothing makes me happier than to hear you play. Of course, but only if you will come and speak with me and be friends, if that is all right. You have yourself a deal, Miss March. If the roof of the house had suddenly flown off, the old gentleman wouldn't have been more astonished. But he liked it, and was so touched and pleased by that confiding little girl that all his sternness vanished, and he just set her on his knee and laid his wrinkled cheek against her rosy one, feeling as if he had got his own little granddaughter back again. Beth ceased to fear him from that moment, and sat there talking to him as cozily as if she had known him all her life, for love casts out fear, and gratitude can conquer pride. When she went home, he walked with her to her own gate, shook hands cordially, and touched his hat as he marched back again, looking very stately and erect, like a handsome, soldierly old gentleman, as he was. Meg, where are you? Will you read to me? I'm in the bedroom. Don't tie it so tight. I'm sorry, Joe, but that's the only way to keep your thick locks up. The pain I have to endure from my one naturally beautiful feature. Are, are you two going somewhere? Never mind. Little girls shouldn't ask questions. Do tell me, Meg. I should think you might let me go, too. Beth is fussing over her piano, and I haven't got anything to do. And ever since I've started studying at home, I'm so lonely. I can't, dear, because you aren't invited. No, Meg, be quiet, or you will spoil it all. You can't go, Amy, so don't be a baby and whine about it. You're going somewhere with Lori, I know you are. You were whispering and laughing together on the sofa last night, and you stopped when I came in. Aren't you going with him? Yes, we are. Now do be still, and stop bothering. Here's your coat, Meg. Amy, let go of the coat! Lori enjoys my company! He said I was charming! Grow up, Amy! Childishness like this is exactly why Lori didn't invite you! That's a lie! He's my friend, too! Joe, give it to me! Go! Where are you going? Tell me, on a drive, the conservatory, into town? Amy... I know, I know. You're going to the theater, aren't you? I shall go, for Mother said I might see it, and I've got my own money, and it was me not to tell me in time. Amy, listen just a minute to me and be a good child. Mother doesn't wish you to go this week because you're not well enough from your cold. Next week you can go to another show with Beth and Hannah and have a nice time. I don't like that half as well as going with you and Lori. Please, Meg. I've been sick with this cold so long, and shut up, I'm dying for some fun. Please. I'll be ever so good. Suppose we take her. I don't believe Mother would mind if we bundled her up well. If she goes, I won't. And if I don't, Lori won't like it. And it will be very rude after he invited only us to go and drag in Amy. I should think she'd hate to poke herself where she isn't wanted. I shall go. Meg says I may, and if I pay for myself, Lori hasn't anything to do with it. Where are my boots? You can't sit with us, for our seats are reserved, and you mustn't sit alone, so Lori will give you his place, and that will spoil our pleasure. Joe! Meg! Coming! You aren't going anywhere, so you can forget your boots and stay up here! Joe! Hurry, girls, or we'll miss the curtain! Come along, Meg. I'm sorry, Amy. You'll be sorry for this, Joe March! See if you won't! Ha! I'm telling you that you could have done it better, Meg. How was the play? Oh, it was wonderful. It was called The Seven Castles of the Diamond Lake. It was bursting with theatrical tricks and lavish costumes. Red imps, sparkling elves, and gorgeous princes and princesses. I was just telling Meg that in our next performance, I think that we should have a fairy, like the one in the play. 
Meg will make a perfect, elegant princess. And that way, Amy can play the fairy. And every time she's meant to be flying, Beth could make a little twinkle on her piano until she lands again. Do you think that would make sense to the audience? Well, I think so. It'd have to be just right. What do you think, Amy? Amy, are you cross with us? I'm not cross with you, Meg. I get it, Amy. But the show was sold out anyway, and there really was no way you could have come. All right, so what have you done? Turned my drawer upside down again? Hid my things? All right, I'll go and see for myself. Amy, we did ask the theater if tickets were available next weekend. There are plenty if you and Beth would like to go. Thank you, Meg. You won't get much conversation from her tonight. I've tried. Very well. May I sit next to you, Beth? I'm freezing and want to warm myself by the fire. Sure. Let me soak it a bit for you. Well? Everything is in its place. The closet, my bags and boxes, all of it. You see? Nothing comes of yelling in revenge. I'm glad to see the two of you maturing into fine young ladies who can forgive wrongs. I'm tired. Good night. Wait, Amy. You know that Marmy said you still need to drink a cup of hot tea before bed for that dreadful cold. Come sit on the hearth and I'll make it for you. But- Mother's orders. Now sit. Beth, do you remember the chapter I read you of my novel with the Enchanted Forest? Perhaps we could turn that into a script and use the fairy music there. Has anyone taken my book? Amy, you've got it. No, I haven't. You know where it is, then. No, I don't. That's a lie. It isn't. I haven't got it, don't know where it is now, and don't care. You know something about it, and you'd better tell me at once, or I'll make you. Scold as much as you like. You'll never see your silly old book again. Why not? I burnt it up. What? My little book I was so fond of and worked over, and meant to finish before father got home. Have you really burnt it up? Yes, I did. I told you I'd make you pay for being so cross, and I have, so- Oh! You wicked, wicked girl! I never can write it again, and I will never forgive you for as long as I live! No! Don't be off of her right now! Don't! Stop! Don't. Don't. Stop! Joe, your sister has something to say. Please forgive me, Joe. I'm very, very sorry. I know how hard you worked on your book the last several years, and I, I had no right to touch it or destroy it, but you made me so angry, and now everyone is angry with me, and... <sighs> and I cannot do anything more than ask for your forgiveness. Joe? I shall never be able to forgive you. But... I'd like to be left alone, please. Go to bed, Amy. I will be there in a minute. I know, my Joe. I can't. My dear, don't let the sun go down upon your anger. Forgive each other, help each other, and begin again tomorrow. It was an abominable thing, and she doesn't deserve to be forgiven. Good night. Hello, Joe. Hello. How's Aunt March? More crotchety and unkind than usual. Well, perhaps she's only unkind because we ostracize her. Ostracize. That's what I said. Maybe we should attempt to forgive our enemies, or at the very least forgive those that have asked for forgiveness. Meg, do you know where my skates are? Lori and I are going. Hannah packed them away in preparation for spring. They're on the floor of our wardrobe on the left side. How dare she go skating with Lori today? She promised that I should go next time, for this is the last ice we shall have. First the play, and now she skates with Lori just to spite me. Don't say that, Amy. I'm sure Lori invited her to put her in better spirits. And besides, you know what you did was awful. She loved that precious book. But it's been two days, and she hasn't so much as look at me. How am I to gain her forgiveness if she won't see how sorry I really am? Joe, I... Is she going to stay angry at me forever? 
Go after them. Don't say anything till Joe has got good-natured with Lori, then take a quiet minute and just smile at her, do some kind thing. I'm sure she'll be friends again. I'll try. <laughs> you look ridiculous! What's wrong with it? You look like a young Russian with all that fur. You're just jealous that my cap looks more boyish than yours. <laughs> I'll race you for it. Deal, but stay here while I go on to the first bend. I want to see if the ice is all right. Make whatever excuse you must to gain the advantage. Joe! Joe! Christopher Columbus. Wait for me to get on my skates, Joe! Keep near the shore. It isn't safe in the middle. I'll race you to the other side. No fair! <sighs> there! I win! What was that? Joe! It's Amy. What? She followed us here. She must have fallen through the ice. Joe! Joe! Joe, stop! Ah! Don't go any further or you'll fall through too. We have to do something! Help me, please! Bring me a rail from the fence. Quick! Hang on, Amy! Joe! Here, don't you go following me. I'll crawl on my stomach. When Amy grabs Help onto me. the rail, you pull me by the legs. Dear God, please, please save her. Grab on, Amy. That's it. That's it! Now, Joe, pull! No, oh, Amy! We have to get her home as quick as we can. I can carry her. Pile our coats onto her while I get off these confounded skates. I'm, I'm sorry, Joe. Are you sure she is safe? Quite safe, dear. She is not hurt and won't even take cold, I think. You were sensible in covering her and getting her home quickly. Lori did it all. I only let her go. Come and sit. You wear the floor away with your pacing. If Lori hadn't been with us, and if he hadn't known what to do, and if there wasn't a loose fence rail by the pond, and if we had been any slower... Joe. Oh, Mother. If she should die, it would all be my fault. It's my dreadful temper. I try to cure it. I think I have, and then it breaks out worse than ever. Oh, Mother, what shall I do? Watch and pray. Never get tired of trying. And never think it is impossible to conquer your anger. You don't know. You can't guess how bad it is. It seems as if I could do anything when I'm in a passion. I get so savage I could hurt anyone and enjoy it. I'm afraid I shall do something dreadful someday and spoil my life and make everybody hate me. <laughs> Joe, dear, we all have our temptations, some far greater than yours, and it often takes us all our lives to conquer them. <laughs> you think your temper is the worst in the world, but mine used to be just like it. Yours, Mother? But you were never angry. I am angry nearly every day of my life, Joe. I have been trying to cure it for 40 years and have only succeeded in controlling it. But I have learned not to show it and I still hope to learn not to feel it, though it may take me another 40 years to do so. Mother, are you angry when you fold your lips tight together and go out of the room sometimes? Like when Aunt Mark scolds or people worry you? Yes. I've learned to check the hasty words that rise to my lips and when I feel that they mean to break out against my will, I just go away for a minute. How did you learn to have such self-control? Your father. He never loses patience, never doubts or complains, but always hopes and works and waits so cheerfully that one is ashamed to do otherwise before him. He helped me and showed me that I must try to practice all the virtues I would have my girls possess. It was easier to try for your sakes than for my own. Oh, Mother, if I'm ever half as good as you, I shall be satisfied. I hope you will be a great deal better, Joe. Try to master this quick temper before it brings you greater sorrow and regret than you have known today. Will you help and remind me the same way Father has for you? Of course, dear. I'm sorry, Mother. Did I grieve you or say something wrong? No, Joe, but speaking of your father reminded me how much I miss him and how much I owe him. Yet you told him to go. I gave my best to the country I love and those more in need of him. Why should I complain when we both have merely done our duty to stand up for what is right? Joe, 
there may come a day when you won't have your mother or sisters or any person to depend on. Go to God with all your little cares and hopes and sins and sorrows as freely and as confidingly as you come to your mother. If you and I practice doing this, perhaps we shall both maintain our tempers forever. I will, Mommy. Do you think God will forgive me for hurting Amy? He already has, Joe. But you must accept it and learn from today. I wouldn't forgive her, and if it hadn't been for Lori, it might have been too late. Joe, will you forgive me? Amy! <laughs> Meg? Margaret, dear? Yes? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I was elsewhere. I could see that. You've been elsewhere all day. You're troubled. I'm not, Mother. You are. You've been troubled since your return from the Moffats. That fortnight away was less restful than you had hoped, wasn't it? Lori told you, didn't he? The young Mr. Lawrence has not said a word. Has he, Joe? Hmm? Oh, um, no. Not to me, he hasn't. It doesn't do to lurk, Joe. Come sit. Shall I stay? Of course. Don't I always tell you everything? I was ashamed to speak of it before the children, but I want you to know all the dreadful things I did at the Moffats. Now, what is troubling you? Did you not want to go? No, nothing of the sort. I was eager to go, especially after you all had been so kind. I was excited about the weather and those silk stockings and the blue sash you gave me from the treasure box. Oh, and that splendid fan, too. I thought it would all go so well with my old tarlatan. You said your tarlatan wasn't cut low enough and that it didn't sweep enough. I said it would do. But yes, I think my discontent was brewing even then. A faded tarlatan is hardly worth all this fuss. Were they unkind to you? Quite the contrary. They are very fashionable, and I was rather daunted at first by the splendor of the house, but they soon put me at my ease. Much. Je suis contente. Au revoir. Annie, Clara, Belle, Margaret has arrived. Oui, Meg, oui. It's magnificent for you to come. Why, thank you. Annie, show young Daisy to her room. I haven't been called that in ages. You'll always be a little flower to me, dear. Now take your time, girls. We're not expected anywhere until this evening. Until then, the Moffat House is a house of leisure. It's lovely. Oh, pish. It's a trifle. Run along now. Thank you, Mother. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Moffat. This way, Daisy. Why does she keep saying thank you? Hush now. I've never seen a hallway this grand. Mother had it redesigned for when Belle came out. Hardly for me. She wanted to for years. That was a good excuse. But I thought Father always said you were a poor excuse. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind then. We'll have a splendid time. Simply splendid. We'll go shopping and riding this afternoon. I thought we were calling on the Lincolns this afternoon. Oh, hush, Clara. There's time enough for both. Yes, and then tomorrow we'll go to town for some shopping. Shopping? For the party. We have to get you ready for Ned. Your brother? Yes, he is just as excited as we are to have you. I heard he's already reserved three dances with you at the party. It'll all be so très magnifique. Très magnifique? Yes. But that doesn't even make sense! Josephine, we're in no place to judge the language of others. But it's simple grammar! Hush now. It sounds as though you had a lovely time. It was. Most lovely. That is, until the second night. What happened then? It was the evening of the small party. The one you packed your poplin for? Yes. Only, once I brought it out, I saw immediately that it wouldn't do. So, naturally, I brought out my tarlatan, but even that looked older and limper and shabbier besides Annie's new one. Did they make fun? No, but I could tell by their glances what they thought. So, whether out of pity or kindness, they lent me such accoutrement as they had to help me make the best of it. So, even though they were helping me to get ready. You only saw pity for our poverty. 
Yes. I say, if it hadn't been for the flowers Laurie sent for me at the house, I dare say I would have come home that evening. Flowers? Laurie is sending you flowers now? Yes. Some lovely roses, heath and fern. It was the only moment the entire visit I felt envied in any way. And that's how you wanted to feel? No. Well, perhaps a bit. In any case, I had just managed to collect my thoughts and enjoy myself at the party when I found myself somewhere I shouldn't have been. I say, Miss March, I am glad to have reserved these dances with you. Thank you, Ned, as am I. You seem a bit winded. Shall I fetch us both a raspberry ice? That would be lovely. I'll wait for you in the conservatory and cool off a bit. Excellent. Well, Meg, you've certainly proved yourself tonight. Oh, I'm sweating right through this. Who did you say the fresh little girl was with the beautiful eyes? That's our house guest. She's an old friend of the girls, and I knew her father once upon a time. She has a remarkably fine voice. Remarkably fine. I've requested another dance with her later on. She has some spring in her. I dare say. Robert, you're called for. In a minute, love, I was just telling Mr. Lincoln here about our guest. A fine girl, if a bit tragic. Not so tragic, dear. She has an admirer, I hear. A rather wealthy one. Indeed? Oh, yes. Her neighbor is quite well off. He sent her the flowers she's wearing tonight. It would be a grand thing for one of those girls, wouldn't it? Mrs. M has made her plans, I dare say, and will play her cards well early as it is. The girl evidently doesn't think of it yet. <laughs> Poor thing. She'd be so nice if she only got up in style. Do you think she'd be offended if we offered to lend her a dress for Thursday? She's proud, but I don't believe she'd mind. For that dowdy tarlatan is all she has. She may tear it, and that will be a good excuse for offering a decent one. Here's hoping, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I'll leave you to it then. Yes, yes. Good to see you, Jane. Yes, yes. What an odd little man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might not have been you they were discussing. Joe. If you didn't hear your name, though. I had heard enough. I was devastated, Mother. Utterly destroyed. I should have said something. And what, child, would you have said? I don't know. I was half resentful towards the Moffat girls and half ashamed of myself. I should have frankly set everything right. The worst was how they treated me so carefully the next day, waiting on me hand and foot. They even went so far as to invite Lori for the big party. Yes, we heard he had gone. Oh, he came all right. But only after they had dolled me up in one of their hand-me-downs so I wouldn't have to wear the same dress twice. It was three times as round as anything I'd ever worn, and it rustled so much as I walked you would have thought I was a forest in the wind. Was it beautiful? Oh, Joe, it was like nothing you've ever seen. Everyone thought so. Men who had only stared at me the night before, not only stared, but asked to be introduced. Several of the girls who had taken no notice of me before were very affectionate all of a sudden. It was glorious. At least, it was until Lori showed up. Meg? Yes, Annie? Who's that young man over there? I haven't a clue. The one staring at you from the library? Why, it's Lori! She seemed positively folle. She should. That, young ladies, is our Daisy's beneficent bow. Lori, I'm so glad you came. Joe wanted me to come and tell her how you looked, so I did. And what shall you tell her? I shall say, I didn't know you, for you looked so grown up and unlike yourself. They dressed me up for fun. <laughs> I rather like it. Hmm. Wouldn't Joe stare if she saw me? Yes, I think she would. Lori, what's troubling you? Troubling? Yes. You've been staring at me with what I can only call undisguised surprise. Surprise? Disapproval, then. Don't you like me so? No, I don't. Why not? I don't like fuss and feathers. You are the rudest boy I ever saw. Meg! Meg, wait! I only wanted to hear you say I'd improved. Please forgive my rudeness. Please, come and dance with me. I'm afraid it would be too disagreeable to you. Not a bit of it. I'm dying to do it. I don't like your gown, but I think you are just splendid. 
come. One dance. Lori, I want you to do me a favor, will you? Won't I? Please don't tell them at home about my dress tonight. They won't understand the joke and it will worry Mother. What shall I say when they ask me? Just say I looked pretty well and was having a good time. I'll say the first with all my heart, but how about the other? You don't look as if you were having a good time. Are you? No, not just now. Don't think I'm horrid. I only wanted a little fun, but this sort doesn't pay, I find, and I'm getting tired of it. Then come home. I'll take you. It will give you a chance to sleep off some of the drink. What drink? I can smell the champagne on your breath, Meg. Your mother doesn't like it, you know. I'm not Meg tonight. I'm a doll who does all sorts of crazy things. Tomorrow, I shall put away my fuss and feathers and be desperately good again. Well, I wish it were tomorrow, then. You'll not tell Marmy and the rest? Silence a la mort. Is that all? Is that all? She drank champagne, mother. Champagne! You're here to listen, Joe, not contribute. I'm sorry. For what, dear? It was abominable, not just to our name, but to Lori as well. I'd hate to have people say such things about him and his family, or about you and father. Just wait till I see Annie Moffat, and I'll show you how to settle such ridiculous stuff. The idea of having plans and being kind to Lori because he's rich and may marry us by and by. Won't he shout when I tell him what those silly things say about us poor children? If you tell Lori, I'll never forgive you. She mustn't, must she, Mother? No. Never repeat that foolish gossip and forget it as soon as you can. I was very unwise to let you go among people of whom I know so little. They're kind, I dare say, but worldly, ill-bred, and full of these vulgar ideas about young people. I am more sorry than I can express for the mischief this visit may have done you, Meg. Mother? Yes? Do you have plans for us, as Mr. Moffat said? Of course I do. A great many. But mine differ somewhat from Mr. Moffat's, I suspect. Give me your hands. Both of you. There. I want you to hear me when I say this. I want my daughters to be beautiful, accomplished, and good. To be admired, loved, and respected. To have a happy youth, to be well and wisely married, and to lead useful, pleasant lives with as little care and sorrow to try them as God sees fit to send. My dear girls, I am ambitious for you, but not to have you make a dash in the world, marry rich men merely because they are rich, or have splendid houses which are not homes because love is wanting. Money is a needful and precious thing, and when well used, a noble thing, but I never want you to think it is the first or only price to strive for. I'd rather see you poor men's wives if you were happy, beloved, contented, than queens on thrones without self-respect and peace. Poor girls don't stand any chance, Belle says, unless they put themselves forward. Then will the old maids. Right, Joe. Better be happy old maids than unhappy wives, or unmaidenly girls running about to find husbands. Don't be troubled, Meg. Poverty seldom daunts a sincere lover. Leave these things to me. Make this home happy so that you may be fit for homes of your own. We will, Marmy. We will. Well then, that's as good a way to say goodnight as any. Up you go and think no more on it. Meg, wait. What is it? Nothing. You've got a look that says it isn't nothing. No, really. It's just that I see you here at this moment. And it is difficult to imagine you... Married? Yes. It's silly. I don't feel this dread of losing Beth or Amy, but I could not bear to have some husband take you away from us. And as I said, it's, well... It isn't silly. Hear this now, I shan't ever leave you, dearest sister. Whatever man Marmy wishes for me, we shall, the four of us, be ever sisters first. Very well. I'll hold you to it. Even if I have to gut every suitor who comes to call. <laughs> That's my joke. Girls... To bed. Yes, yes mother. mother. Come along. Lori said we would have exciting mail today. Did we have to receive it on such a hot day? I believe I'm going to melt. Don't be so dramatic, Amy. It's good for our hearts and our pride. Go ahead and use your key, Beth. Two 
to Margaret, Josephine, Elizabeth, and Amy March from Theodore Lawrence. Must he be so formal? It's lovely. For Miss Meg March, one letter and a glove. What? I left a pair over there, and here's only one. Are you sure there isn't another? There is only one here. I hate to have odd gloves. Never mind. The other may be found. My letter is only a translation of the German song I wanted. I think Mr. Brook did it. For this isn't Laurie's writing. This is the special one for all of us. To my dearest neighbors, some English girls and boys are coming to see me tomorrow, and I want to have a jolly time. Their names are the Vons, and we spent time with them when Grandfather and I were in Europe. I have also invited our mutual friend, Ned Moffat, of whom I believe Meg is acquainted. <laughs> wow. If it's fine, I'm going to pitch my tent in the meadow and row up the whole crew to lunch and croquet. We will have a fire, make messes, and have all sorts of larks. They are nice people and like such things. Brooke will go to keep us boys steady, and Kate Vaughn will play propriety for the girls. I want you all to come. Can't let Beth off at any price. And nobody shall worry her. Don't bother about rations. I'll see to that and everything else. Only do come. In a tearing hurry, yours ever, Lori. P.S. Please consider this your ticket to Camp Lawrence. I've never been this far away from home <laughs> before. It's just next door, Amy. We have to beat the boys, Amy. It's the principle of the thing. Since when were there principles in croquet? I'm through. Now, Miss Joe, I'll settle you and get in first. Fred Vaughn, if you think I didn't see that, you must think me blind. You pushed the ball with your toe. It rolled a bit, perhaps, but that is allowed. So stand off, please, and let me have a go at the stake. We don't cheat in America, but you can if you choose. Joe! Yankees are a deal the most tricky, everybody knows. What do you say, Laurie? I declare myself Switzerland. Ned continued the story. Instantly, the knight recovered himself, pitched the tyrants out of the window, and turned to join the lady victorious. She found Sir Nigel handsome and wished to be by him forever. She told him that her name was Margareta. Oh, brother. And that she wanted to take her far away from this tower and marry and protect her. <laughs> Did he wish to pass your turn, Ned? <laughs> no, no, I just thought Meg would... Anyways, he found the door locked, so he tore up the curtains, made a rope ladder, got halfway down when the ladder broke, and he went headfirst into the moat, sixty feet below. It was full of spiders as big as your fist, and toads that would frighten you into hysterics, Miss March. Oh my, not toads. At the top of these steps, he came plump upon a sight that took his breath away. Miss Margareta came towards him and leaned in for a kiss. Uh, it's your turn, Meg. Continue the story. Suddenly, when Margareta's lips touched Sir Nigel's, she revealed her true form. A tall figure, in all white, with a veil over its face and a lamp in her wasted hand. The knight's blood turned to ice. With unnatural strength, she dragged him, gliding noiselessly before him down a corridor to his doom. <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple game. You just tell the truth to whatever question you are asked. Sounds simple enough. I'll go first. Which lady here do you think prettiest? Margaret. Which girl do you like the most? Joe, of course. What silly questions you ask. All right, you play then. What is your greatest fault? A quick temper. What do you most wish for? A pair of boot lacings. Not a true answer. You must say what you really do want most. Oh, of course. Mm, genius. Don't you wish you could give it to me, Lori? How well you draw, Miss Vaughn. I told you, Meg, you must call me Kate. After all, Mr. Brooke and I are meant to be the chaperones of this trip, and we are only a few years older than you. That is true. All right, then. So we are Kate, Meg, and John. Oh, well, Kate. 
I was only going to say that I wish I could draw like you. Why don't you learn? I should think your governess would be willing to grant you a few private lessons. I don't have one. Ah, I forgot young ladies in America go to school more than us. Very fine schools they are too, Papa says. You go to a private one, I suppose? I don't go at all. I'm a governess myself. Oh dear me, how dreadful. Young ladies in America love independence as much as their ancestors did, and are admired and respected for supporting themselves. Oh, yes, of course. It's very nice and proper of them to do so, I'm sure. Excuse me, I must check on my brother. Fred! I forgot that English people rather turn up their noses at governesses and don't treat them as we do. Tutors also have a rather hard time of it there. As I know to my sorrow, there's no place like America for us workers, Miss Margaret. I'm glad I listened it then. I don't like my work, but I get a good deal of satisfaction out of it after all, so I won't complain. I only wish I liked teaching as you do. I think you would if you had Laurie for a pupil. I shall be very sorry to lose him next year. Going to college, I suppose? Yes. It's high time he went, for he is ready. And what happens to you then? I shall turn soldier. I need it. That is very good of you to go, Mr. Brooks. But I'm sure your family will worry about you so. I have no family, and very few friends to care whether I live or die. That isn't true. Laura and his grandfather will care a great deal, and we should all be very sorry to have any harm happen to you. Thank you. That sounds pleasant. Did the German song suit, Miss March? Yes, but I did wonder about the third line. I said I would help row too. And I said relax. We'll be home in a few minutes with the current behind us, and Brooke and I are keeping a great pace. But Laurie... Who is the general of Camp Lawrence again? <laughs> <laughs> well, General. <clears throat> general. Well, General. You did a mighty fine job of hosting this outing. Even if your British friends are cheaters and snobs, they are kind and good-natured. I'm glad you think so. And I'm glad that you all enjoyed yourselves, even with my guests. I've seen you March girls every day this summer, and I had to be certain I wasn't being hypnotized by my captors. Even Beth made friends with that young, quiet Vaughn boy, Fred's brother. And Meg seems to have thwarted any further wooing Nid Muffet would try on her. <laughs> Good riddance! Not so loud, he'll hear you in the other <laughs> boats. <laughs> <sighs> the summer is almost over, Teddy. Soon we'll be sequestered to our boring parlors and study, and not leave until it's time for supper. And you'll be busy with college. And I doubt there will be a sunset that early until next summer. I wish every day could be like this. So do I, Joe. What a dreary October day. If something very pleasant should happen now, we should think it a delightful month. I feel as if nothing happens in this family anymore. I feel restless. You can join us in pottery, Meg. I'm working on the beginnings of an ornate vase for the mantle. And Beth is making... It started as a bowl, but I believe it will be a mud pie now. <laughs> will you join us, Meg? Or will you continue gazing out the window like some tragic book heroine with too much money? All right, all right. I dare say the only way women like us acquire too much money is by marrying rich. But it's a new world! Joe and I are going to make fortunes for you all. Just wait ten years and see if we don't. Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. Hello, Lori. Hello, Joe. What are we discussing today? Oh, where we will be in ten years' time. That's a rather ambitious topic. Wait until you hear our plans. I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. You first. Well, after I'd seen as much of the world as I want to, I'd like to settle in Germany and have just as much music as I choose. I'm to be a famous musician myself. And I'm never to be bothered about money or business, but just enjoy myself and live for what I like. That's my dream. Who's next? Mine is to stay at home safe with father and mother and help take care of the family. 
Don't you wish for anything else? Since I had my little piano, I am perfectly satisfied. I only wish we may all keep well and be together. Nothing else. I have ever so many wishes, but the pet one is to be an artist and go to Rome and do fine pictures and be the best artist in the whole world. Undoubtedly, that is in the plan for our young Raphael. What's yours, Meg? I should like a lovely house full of all sorts of luxurious things. I'm to be mistress of it and manage it as I like with plenty of servants so I never need work a bit. How I should enjoy it, for I wouldn't be idle but do good and make everyone love me dearly. Wouldn't you have a man for your castle in the air? I said nothing of the sort. Why don't you say you'd have a splendid, wise, good husband and some angelic little children? You know your castle wouldn't be perfect without them. You'd have nothing but horses, inkstands, and novels in yours. Wouldn't I, though? I'd have a stable full of Arabian steeds, rooms piled high with books, and I'd write out of a magic inkstand so that my work should be as famous as Laurie's music. I want to do something splendid before I go into my castle. Something heroic or wonderful that won't be forgotten after I'm dead. I don't know what, but I'm on the watch for it. And I mean to astonish you all someday. You astonish us every day, Joe. Yes, with your boyish manners and acts of passion. Tease all you want, sisters. For I mean to astonish you a bit more today. What do you mean? It's time to practice your reading today, Amy. Why don't you read us this headline in today's paper? <sighs> the Rival Painters. A short story by... Miss Josephine March? What will no. father say? When, <laughs> when did it come? Stop <laughs> jabbering and I'll tell you. Two weeks ago, I walked to town and gave two of my stories to Mr. Dashwood, the editor of the paper. I didn't tell any of you because I couldn't bear the disappointment if he said no. Laurie caught me on the walk home. When I went to get my answer, the man said he liked them both, but didn't pay beginners, only let them print in his paper to be noticed. So I let him have the two stories, and today this was sent to me. And he said it was good, and if I shall write more, he will pay for them. Oh, Joe! <laughs> I'm so happy! In time, I may be able to support myself and help the family. Oh, my Joe, I am so proud! What did I say about becoming rich and famous? Perhaps our castles in the sky are closer at hand than we realized. Hurrah for Miss March, the celebrated American authoress! What's going on in here? Joe was published in the paper! Miss Josephine March. Congratulations, Joe. Are you pleased, Mother? Of course I am, my dear. I'm sorry if I'm out of sorts. I just came from the post office, and your father's letter that was meant to come today wasn't there. But not to worry. Father is regular as the sun, but the post has been known to be delayed before. I'm sure all is well. Why don't you take a seat, Marmy? Thank you, dear. I shall, but I'm fine. Can I do anything for you, Madam Mother? You're a dear, Laurie, but no. In fact, why don't we all sit here and listen to Joe's story? All right. Well, remember that the next one will be even better. <clears throat> the Rival Painters. A short story by Miss Josephine March. Viola picked up her brush to dip into the paint that was as deep a crimson as a broken-hearted lover's blood. It's one of them horrid telegraph things, Mum. <gasps> Marmy? Sit back down, Mother. You're pale. Mrs. March, let me help you. Here, Joe. Mrs. March, your husband is very ill. Come at once. S. Hale Bank Hospital, Washington. Dear God, please. Please save him. I shall go at once, but it may be too late. You must help me to bear it, children. The Lord keep the dear man. I won't waste no time a crying, but get your things ready right away, Mum. She's right. There's no time for tears now. Be calm, girls, and let me think. Where's Laurie? Here, ma'am. How can I help? Send a telegram saying I will come at once. The next train goes early in the morning. I'll take that. What else? The horses are ready. I can go anywhere. Do anything. You can leave a note at Aunt March's. Meg, give me that pen and paper. Joe, you will run and tell Mrs. King that I won't be here to help the church. On the way, get these things that I'll put down. They'll be needed, and I must go prepared for nursing. 
Hospital stores are not always good. Beth, you will go and ask Mr. Lawrence for a couple of bottles of old wine. I'm not too proud to beg for father. He shall have the best of everything. Amy, tell Hannah to get down the black trunk. And Meg, do come and help me find my things, for I'm half bewildered. Is there anything else we can do, Mother? Pray for your father, my dears. I cannot accept such generosity. Miss March, you shall. I will check on the girls each day and make sure they want for nothing. And we will continue to do work here and do good at the Lawrence home, Marmy. But, Mr. Brook, you... I insist. I'll have you know, he volunteered himself. Volunteered himself for what? I came to offer myself as escort to your mother. Mr. Lawrence has commissions for me in Washington, and it will give me real satisfaction to be of service to her there. Mr. Brook, it will be such a relief to know a friend is traveling with Marmy. Thank you, John. What a great man you are. I suppose that means I'll have to come join the March school. All right, then. Thank you, Mr. Brook. I believe I have everything we shall need. We should all prepare for bed soon, as we will be leaving early in the morning. Has Joe returned yet, Hannah? Not yet, ma'am. Where could she be? Perhaps you should take a seat, madam. No use in working yourself half to death before your journey. Children, I leave you to Hannah's care and Mr. Lawrence's protection. Hannah is faithfulness itself, and our good neighbor will guard you as if you were his own. There you are, child. <sighs> Here, Mommy. That's my contribution toward making Father comfortable and bringing him home. Twenty-five dollars? Joe, I hope you haven't done anything rash. <sighs> no, it's mine, honestly. I didn't beg, borrow, or steal it. I earned it. And I don't think you'll blame me, for I only sold what was my own. What did you sell? Well, if I remove my hat... My oh, dear Joe! Oh, Joe! Oh, it doesn't affect the fate of the nation, so don't wail. It's only hair, and selling it was the best way to make money before everywhere shut down for the night. Besides, it will be good for my vanity. I'm satisfied, so please take the money and let's all move along. Dear, while I appreciate your contribution, I know how fond you are of your looks and worry that you'll regret this. I won't. I would have sold my own nose off my face if it would help father. Please take it, Marmy. All right, Joe. Thank you. Make room for me, Teddy. Are you copying me, Joe? That cut looks familiar. In your dreams. Thank you all. So much. Mr. Brooke and I will be on the train tomorrow before you all wake. Meg, dear, be prudent, watch over your sisters, consult Hannah, and in any perplexity, go to Mr. Lawrence. Be patient, Joe. Don't get despondent or do rash things. Write to me often and be my brave girl, ready to help and cheer all. Beth, comfort yourself with your music. Care for others and be faithful to the little home duties that require your enormous heart. And you, Amy, help all you can. Be obedient and keep happy safe at home. Go about with your work and bear each other's burdens and grief with love. We will, Mother. You needn't spare a worry for things here, Mom. That's right. You take care of Mr. March and bring him home to your girls. Thank you. Truly. Now, we should all get some rest. Come here, girls. Hope and keep busy. And whatever happens, remember that you never can be fatherless. Good night, my darlings. Joe, is that you? <laughs> Joe? You're still awake. Move over and let me under your blankets. Are you crying about father? No, not now. What then? I know that I should be crying about that, but please don't laugh at me or lecture. What is it? It's... My hair. Oh, Joe. I'd do it again tomorrow if I could. It's only the vain part of me that goes and cries in this silly way. 
Please don't tell anyone, Meg. I thought you were asleep, so I just made a little private moan for my one beauty. I won't tell. It's all right. How can I be so selfish when our own father is so ill? And mother will be gone when we wake. Because, try as you might, we aren't perfect. I do love them more than my silly hair. And I try to love others more than myself. It's so difficult to do at times, but I try. I know. Does God? I'm so worried of what he thinks of me. Yes, Joe. What does Marmee always remind us? <laughs> For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. <laughs> Who knows, Joe? And perhaps we shall know someday too. <laughs> Little Women, a radio play, was written by Morgan McCall and Michael Carey, based on the novel by Louisa May Alcott. Our production was directed by Jessica Rumrow. Our lead audio engineer was Daniela Brown, with assistance from Joshua Taylor, David Lowen, and Alexis Nomorosa. Our stage manager was Alexis Nomorosa, and our assistant stage manager was Kaylee Wilson. Our assistant director was Autumn Ford. With music composed and engineered by Ryan Ardelk. The part of Joe March was played by Hallie Unruh, Meg March by Isabella Stevenson, Beth March by Evelyn Clark, and Amy March by Lauren Robertson. The part of Theodore Lawrence was played by Christian Shepherd. Mrs. March, or Marmy, was played by Abby Yee, and Mr. March by Nick Phillips. Hannah Brown was played by Kaya Von Beck, Mr. Lawrence by Dalton Smith, and Aunt March by Gloria Hartung. John Brook was played by David Lowen, and Professor Friedrich Baer was played by Eric Evans. The part of Fred Vaughn was played by Jackson Swing, Kate Vaughn by Rebecca Gadam, Annie Moffat by Gretchen Carpenter, Belle Moffat by Jessica Mangles, Clara Moffat by Leslie Apollinar, Ned Moffat by Connor Anderson, Mrs. Moffat by Eden Rutledge, Mr. Moffat by David Lowen, Mr. Lincoln by Hasiel Rodriguez, and Dr. Bangs by A.J. Flores. Our narrator was played by Anna Metis. A special thank you to the GCU Recording Lab, Candace Stewart, Morgan McCall, Michael Carey, and the College of Arts and Media. Little Women, a radio play, will be continued in the next installment. Please visit www.littlewomenradioplay.com for more information. <laughs>